Okay, members, you're welcome to show the whole firm. We are glad that we are always having you join us on uh, this week a webinar. Uh, today's webinar is a bit special, and I invite you that you stay on and we, we move together. So for those who are joining us for the first time today, I want to invite you to Busoga with Firm. Our vision is to see a whole the thriving Busoga. And we are working, uh, we are having very many innovations that we achieve this. And um, as Busoga with Firm, we are an organization uh, that is head with, with their headquarters in Ginger City. We are a not-for-profit and we are mobilizing those people who want to see the growth of this region in terms of health, eh, to work together with them. So we encourage everyone who, who wants to put a hand uh, on improving health eh, within this region and even beyond eh, to come and work with us. So far, we are working with the Minister of Health. Eh, we are working with um, the district health teams. But we're also working with those non-informal structures to see that we, we put efforts together and we improve the health eh, in this region. Our vision is to rally Bushaga professions, uh, to use evidence, to engage community, government, partner actions for better health of children, youth, women, and men within this region. And our program areas, so we have Ramna, that's a productive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health. And if you're to be keen, today's presentation will be lying in the first program area of Bushaga Firm. We are having interventions in malaria, HIV, and TB, regional planning and data use, infectious and non-infectious, infectious and non-communicable diseases, but we are also targeting urban health issues because we are growing country and we are having a lot of emerging urban areas. You can reach to Russell Growth from through those contacts. You can always spend such presentations after on our website, but also on our YouTube channel. But you can also write to us on at in, uh, on info at usogreatherfirm.org. We encourage you to become a member of Usogreatherfirm kindly by paying your subscription to the bus continue having such sessions. Today we have just enlarged our Zoom and we ask you to continue being paying your subscription to be able to facilitate such interventions to go on. Membership is 100K uh, for an individual and this runs for a year. 500,000 for institutions, and you can become a lifetime same member of Sogeth Firm by paying one million shilling. That's all about Sogeth Firm, and at this time, I want to invite um, uh, Professor Richard, who is our moderator for today. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. And um, Thank you, colleagues and the membership and visitors to Busoga Health Forum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, today we have a special day and uh, to welcome a special visitor and a special um, speaker who will share with us as on new natural health. Uh, Professor uh, Joy Lon, who is our speaker today, um, was born here in this, uh, in, in, in this country before, um, before her family moved to Ireland. And then uh, she studied uh, pediatrics in, an, in um, a medical school and pediatrics in Nottingham, and uh, eventually came to work and spent quite a bit of her time, her life, in, uh, in Kumasi, Ghana, uh, where she set up a neonatal, um, in a neonatal care unit. Um, her interest in newborn health uh, really grew from there, especially uh, with the number of deaths I think some of us have experienced in many of our neonatal uh, units. Um, she went to the US and uh, studied public health at Emory University, um, worked with the CDC, and then worked with Save the Children Fund, uh, sorry, uh, Save the Children in, uh, in programs in newborn health. And uh, eventually before coming to join the um, um, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as a professor of uh, maternal, adolescent, and child and child health. 
um, he is extensively published in neonatal health, in child health, and has worked extensively in uh, developing some of the interventions which we, we have for newborn health today, including in the Lancet series um, on newborn health, looking at uh, newborn survival, um, reducing stillbirth and uh, premature uh, deliveries. So uh, we are really eagerly awaiting for you, Professor Joy um, Lon. You're most, uh, most welcome to Uganda. She has been coming here and uh, working with uh, Professor uh, uh, Peter Waiswa, Kalitang, and, uh, and the others who are really working in newborn health. And, um, and of course, all our, the activities on the, on the African continent. We welcome you to Busoga Health Forum today. And um, many of us here in child health, in public health, um, in programming, are uh, eagerly awaiting. And uh, after her, we will have um, a short uh, talk from the commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Maternal and Child Health. Professor Lon, you are welcome. Dr. Idro and fellow Ugandans, it's such an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, uh, I'm particularly impressed that you meet at this time on a Friday night. I think in many countries that level of dedication would be saluted. Um, and I really am uh, delighted to be back here in Uganda and to have the honor of speaking with you tonight. I wish we could be face to face and I'm very excited that I will be in Basoga the week after next on my way through to Karamoja. I'm hoping to stop at Jinja. So in the time that we have together, uh, I want to uh, look at this important issue of the race towards the sustainable development goals. And Uganda has committed on many sustainable development goals. Um, and particularly want to zero in on babies and learn what can we do to go faster in Uganda and beyond. So for those of you who read the monitor, you may have seen a famous uh, name of uh, Professor Peter Weiswa in the monitor, uh, looking at the loss of 45,000 newborns and stillbirths every year in Uganda. This is a huge, number. It's actually the leading cause of death. So it's not uh, just ethically important to look at newborns and our start in life, uh, but it's also imperative for the future of Uganda. And by the end of this talk, I hope maybe we can think about how tomorrow's news could be different from today's, because this should not be acceptable. And Uganda really led a lot of the fight against HIV. And a lot of the leadership uh, that you have here for many issues uh, can speak up more loudly for newborns in Uganda and beyond. And before I start, I want to salute the leadership of Peter. Uh, Professor Peter Weiss, a friend of mine for nearly 20 years. I've learned so much from him. Uh, he says that I mentor him, but I have learned much from him. And this is a picture taken just today, uh, also with Peter, with um, Pia Sakong, a wonderful friend. Uh, so looking around in Uganda, so much leadership uh, and people who really want to act. Um, and I think all of us want to see that tomorrow's news will be different. So how can we do that? So I think our hope for tomorrow in Uganda, in each of our families and around the world is that every woman and every newborn everywhere, wherever they're born, should be able not just to survive, but to thrive. And you can see in this uh, woman's eyes, the hope for herself and for her baby to come. And behind her, this is the hospital that I was born in. So as Dr. Idru has shared, I'm from Karamoja. <laughs> uh, I was born there and lived there till I was a teenager. And this is Maroto Hospital. I will be there in a, a few weeks time. Um, and I'm excited to see if it looks different. This was when I was last here a few years ago. So when my mother went into labor, um, I don't know, maybe somebody might need to mute. Um, 
when my mother went into labor, she had an obstructive labor. She was taken into this hospital. And at the time there wasn't electricity. And during the night, somebody came round with a paraffin lamp and she was able to see that the woman in the bed next to her had very tragically expired. And in the morning, they were able to find somebody who hadn't done a cesarean section, they'd actually done hernia operations before, who did a cesarean section on my mother, cutting her from zipper sternum to pubis. And I came out alive. Fortunately, I didn't need resuscitation because I'm not sure there was any equipment. And my mother and I survived because there was a midwife. There were other people who stood up for us. And for each of you in Basoga and beyond, that is our job. And our job is to stand up and speak, to change things, but also to use evidence to do that. And what I would like to share with you is evidence both on what to do, but also learning on how to do that. And I want to start from the human start that all of us have. Each one of us, whatever our privilege or threats now, we entered the world the same. Naked, vulnerable, maybe we cried, maybe we didn't. And now there are 134 million live births. The world peaked at about 145 several years ago and it's coming down every year. The only continent where births are still going up is across the African continent. But we don't enter equal. There are about 10 million births in high income countries, about 47 high income countries. And that is where a lot of the evidence, both for maternal health and also for neonatal health, most of the Cochrane reviews, trials, evidence that we have come from these contexts. And if you're born into this context, then even if you're a 26 weeker like this baby, so when I was doing neonates in the UK, looking after really extremely vulnerable preterm babies. And the survival of those babies now at about 25 weeks is similar often to what we see in Africa at about 30 or 32 weeks. So there's so much more that we can do. Upper middle income countries, more countries have graduated into this band. And in many ways, the challenge here is of over-medicalization. So for example, in Brazil, a normal birth is now a cesarean section. About 53% of births are cesarean sections. In China, which we will look at in a minute, has made rapid progress, fastest progressing in the world for newborn survival, but really highly medical, babies locked up in incubators and women not able to enter. And then if we look at the majority of the world, low and middle income countries, we still have around 24 million births at home. When Peter and I started working, this was the other way around. 60 million births were at home. And we had to do things at the community. And it's still important to do things in the community. But what we learned for a lot of those community trials is we then send mothers or babies to facilities where we have very poor quality of care. And then this is now the majority world. 60 million births in facilities where we've crowded women in. We're still often in the same hospital that was built 20 years ago, 30 years ago, even 70 years ago during colonial areas and haven't been improved or changed. There isn't space or respect for women. And it's even worse for babies because most of those hospitals were designed before we even thought of having a room for babies. So we have some tiny room where we're trying to provide care with without space, without respect for women, uh, without the ability to improve on quality and with high risk of infections. So around the world, and this is also true in Uganda, this is the place where we have the greatest risk, but also the hugest opportunity for rapidly bringing survival to a different level. And I was in a Coempi hospital today and I salute the changes that have been made, but it's also still really critical to move forward with quality of care. So if we look at what the consequences are for the world, there are now around 3 
100,000 maternal deaths, unacceptable. And they have come down. And I salute Uganda, particularly for the progress that you've made recently on this. And also some of your neighboring countries, uh, Tanzania has just had a really fantastic drop in maternal mortality. For child survival, where we have been focusing now uh, for several decades, really significant progress after the first month of life. So even after the first month of life and by 20 years, we don't just want to get to five, right? There are 3.5 million deaths in the most recent data, but that's gone down by half a million just in the last year. It's still really uh, making great progress. But for neonatal deaths, 2.3 million, this is almost half of under five deaths. And this is a flat line for the number over the last several years. Um, and still not on the agenda, 1.9 million stillbirths. Stillbirths, uh, we count from 22 weeks of gestation, but our WHO estimates, which we contribute to from our team, uh, are from 28 weeks of gestation. So this is most shocking, particularly for about a million who died during labor. So stillbirths are as preventable as neonatal deaths and often omitted. So this is a shocking total of 8 million deaths, women and children every year, and most vulnerable, as we've seen, for example, in the tragedies in Gaza recently, to crisis, but also to climate crises. And Africa, with about 15% of the world's population, carries more than 50% of this global burden. Unacceptable. Moving closer and closer to the time of birth. And what about the scores for Uganda? So taking the Uganda DHS and the data used by the government, so assuming 1.5 million births a year, there's still a really distressing number of deaths. Around 2,800 maternal deaths, so this has dropped, but still has a way to go. There are shocking 22,500 stillbirths and then 33,000 neonatal deaths, first four weeks after birth. So this is a, a really large number of deaths and also a large number of newborns who need care to prevent those deaths. So how can we go faster together to look at what we can do for neonatal care. Well, the good news is that, that Uganda has a target. So Uganda has seriously committed to the sustainable development goal target of reaching a neonatal mortality rate of 12 per thousand live births by 2030. That's the good news. The difficult news is that 2030 is around the corner now. So really important to think about how fast do you need to go to get from 22 to 12. What's happening now is clearly not going to get there because that rate of 22 has been a bit of a flat line. And I congratulate uh, Peter and uh, the amazing team from Macquarie University that presented the situation analysis this week that led to the article in the Monitor. So this really needs to change. And so our question is, how do we go faster? How are we going to get from 22 to 12? Well, if you want to go faster, a really uh, important principle is to look at the data. So this is a paper that uh, T. Spormer and some colleagues, including myself, uh, published in Lancet uh, last year. And it's looking at the relationship bet between maternal mortality ratio and combined stillbirth and neonatal deaths and a mortality transition. How do you get from high to low? So the sustainable development uh, target for stillbirth, neonatal mortality and maternal mortality are in this phase four. And Uganda is currently in phase three. So always to get from here to here, you always have to do more. To get from here to here, you definitely have to do more. And this needs us to do more complex care, more systems change, but also a data transition that will help us to drive that change to be quicker, but also to be safe and equitable. So to do that, there are critical packages of care. So pregnancy care, antenatal care, birth care, routine postnatal care, and then neonatal care in hospitals. 
And these four packages are the priority, both of the uh, um, ending preventable maternal mortality uh, targets, but also the every newborn. And together, we worked to set targets. And the reason we picked these four packages is because of the high impact. So green is the estimated number of stillbirths saved. Blue is the estimated number of maternal deaths saved. And the middle blue is neonatal lives saved. And if you look at this, pregnancy care actually is most important for stillbirths. By not counting stillbirths, we're failing to count impact and maybe failing to make the case. So for example, there are more stillbirths now from malaria than there are child deaths. So looking at the investment during antenatal care for malaria is really critical, but also things like syphilis that we shouldn't be seeing. Birth care has an effect on maternal, neonatal and stillbirths, and particularly those intrapartum stillbirths. But if you're looking for the one place where you have the most effect on neonatal deaths, it's actually newborn care in hospitals. And then if we look at what the targets are that have been set with every newborn and the maternal group, it's 90, 90, 80, 80, I guess, uh, trying to take a leaf out of the HIV book. And if we look at where Uganda is for this, Uganda is at about 66% uh, of antenatal clinic visit pool. Really fantastically, you've had a big jump of birth center facilities, but a big quality gap here. The postnatal care is coming up, but for neonatal care, we don't actually have a good measure. And it's I'm putting 10% here, but from the situation analysis and the recent EMONC, it may be a place where we have major step forward. It is on the newborn care in hospitals. And I'm just going to drop my camera in case the internet is a problem. So how do we go faster? Well, one way is to look at history. So uh, this is history from the UK, has a fake Brit. I'm not sure I want to learn from the UK at the moment. We certainly have plenty of problems. Uh, the US also has uh, some, some things that we want to learn from and maybe some things that we don't want to learn from. But if we look at history here, this is going back to 1900 and what the neonatal mortality rate was. What you can see is when did they reach a neonatal mortality rate of 12? And it's really uh, coming up to around the time of 1980, which is when neonatal intensive care was in its infancy. It's really special neonatal care that helped to get to this level. But this actually took quite a long time for the US and the UK to get from where Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are now, kind of in the 20s, down to 12. Now we can definitely do better than that now. And we must do better than that. There's more in our hands. We have more opportunity. Things have changed for women and for care. So if Sub-Saharan Africa is at about 27, uh, South Asia about 23. And remember that uh, uh, Uganda is at 22. So better than most of Sub-Saharan Africa, but a very steep uh, drop still needed. The easy things have mostly already been done. So of course there are subpopulations in Uganda where maybe the neonatal mortality rate is still higher. Home births where we still need to look at uh, more basic things to do. So for example, in my home region of Karamoja, clean safe birth, tetanus, toxoid, and so on. Then we come to this phase two and normally the most important thing in phase two actually is family planning. And this is still a gap in Uganda, and Peter highlighted this importantly in the situation analysis. So Uganda actually for family planning is still in phase two, even though the rest of your indicators are in phase three. But Uganda is currently in phase three, improved maternity care and needing special neonatal care. But to get down to the SDG level of 12, you have no choice but to move towards neonatal intensive care. So at least having respiratory support for newborns, it's not possible to get to 12 without that. So if we look at who has done this at the same level of speed that we need to go at in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, China is the only country that has achieved that. So China is the fastest reducing neonatal mortality rate in the world. And there are things we can learn, but also maybe things that we don't want to copy. But one important thing that they did 
was to really implement for neonatal care with newborn units, um, with standard floor plans, improving the human resources, having a bundle of devices and moving forward. There were things we wouldn't want to copy, for example, not having women uh, have, have access and be able to be with their babies, including kangaroo mother care. So if we look at the world, and Hans Rosling really underlines this, often we live uh, in the past. There are actually no countries now with a neonatal mortality rate above 45. There are, of course, subnational inequalities. So there are, for example, parts of northern Nigeria or rural Ethiopia where this is true. Um, and then most of the world is now in this uh, group, phase three, which is where Uganda is. Sub-Saharan Africa's fastest reducing neonatal mortality rate is Malawi, and I want to come back to that later. The fastest in the world is China. And if we look in this group of five to 15, which is around where the uh, SDG target is, it's actually most of the stands um, where again, they have been scaling up neonatal care. So this is really critical in the mortality transition and also needing to look at how you move, not just your mortality and your care, but also your data. So this was uh, shown uh, at the meeting that Peter and I have been at this week. This is part of an investment case for uh, uh, neonatal care across Uganda, so reaching every district. If we were to reach 80% of districts with quality in Uganda, this list estimate, live saved uh, tool estimates, suggests that Uganda could come very close to reaching the target. So this is what we want tomorrow's news to be. We have a lot of the pieces in place here in Uganda. I salute you. There are a few countries that are better at policies than Uganda. There are many relevant policies. You have the targets, you have the sharpen plan, you have the new newborn situation analysis, you have clinical guidelines. There are standards that are in draft and are coming. But the critical part here is implementation. And there are centers of excellence to really lead the way in regions. Uh, so, uh, you know, in Bali, Mbara, as well as ones in Kampala. But the critical thing is to reach across the country. So I want to inspire us by looking at what India has done. India went from having uh, just around 18 uh, special care neonatal units, and that's similar to where Uganda may be at the moment. Looking at the Imonk, we may have slightly less. Um, and obviously, India has a much bigger population than Uganda. Uh, but they went in this really intentional way forward and they made it easy for themselves by having standard floor plans, HR ratios, device lists, uh, training materials that, that uh, really allowed on-site training uh, with virtual approaches, um, a, a unified data set that was centralized so people could compare with each other, and most importantly, significant government investment. So this is a key step to learn from. I know that on this call, not all of you are neonatal. I'm sure there are fantastic pediatricians and neonatals, but are also people who do other things, which is important. So I just wanted to show this baby. This is a 28-weeker baby. Uh, he's called Chikon Jetso. He's less than a day old. And this is different from doing, for example, one injection or uh, providing one antibiotic. To save this vulnerable newborn, we need to look after their respiratory distress, their temperature, infections, nutrition, and so on. So we need more than one intervention, and we also need more than one systems change. I'm happy to show you Chikon Jetso here. So his name means the conqueror, and that is what we aspire to for every newborn in Uganda and across Africa. He's in Malawi, and he was lucky to be at the part of a an early CPAP trial, uh, but now it's possible for us to have low-cost CPAP uh, that is safe, not just the improvised devices, and to bring that uh, to all who need it. So an important principle in public health and in primary health care is looking at a package and making sure the package is evidence-based, that it has enough things in to have impact but not to add lots of additional things that have small impact, but a lot of cost. So there's been a lot of work by WHO and others based on evidence to say, what is the evidence-based package 
that we need for small and sick newborn care that has enough to get us impact to get to 12, that SDG, but doesn't have too much in it to be too complicated or too costly. So at the top, we have the essential newborn care that we need at birth on maternity units and so on. And this has been a focus in Uganda for 20 years now. And of course, there are still gaps. Uh, the situation analysis shows, for example, missed opportunities with throwing out colostrum or important things like uh, cord care and delayed clamping that should be very doable. But if we don't move now to reach most of the country and districts with this package uh, highlighted in the blue, we won't be able to reach the SDG. And within this, the lines are not all equal. So the highest impact is the respiratory support for preterm newborns, including continuous positive uh, airways pressure, and then also kangaroo mother the care and the combination of those is really critical. So this is the package that we need to scale up to at least 80% of districts, including here in Uganda. If we start to add lots of these other things, they don't have so much impact. For example, surfactant, uh, you know, is more useful once you get to an neonatal mortality rate of about five. That was when we started trialing it in the UK. It was part of those early trials and it costs a lot. So if we start to add lots of things that are extremely expensive without so much gain, we won't be able to reach everybody with the equity. And I want to underline just the transformative nature of kangaroo mother care. So kangaroo mother care today in Kwempi, I saw father, kangaroo father care, KFC, also important. Um, and during the time that this has happened, it has come from the Southern Hemisphere to all over the world to be a standard of care. And it's come from this idea that it was a solution for poor people, something we did if we couldn't do other care, to it now being standard of care, including in, for example, uh, Karolinska and Sweden. So this is top standard of care for newborns. And I really want to salute uh, all the team that were involved with us in Omwana, I want to thank Ginger and Eganga from your Basogo region, region and all the hospitals that were involved in the Omwana trial, which really has helped to move things forward. So in this talk, I'm not going to go into Omwana in detail. I want to salute both the uh, leadership on the science, but also the wonderful uh, team who were involved. I'm not sure if Victor, Dr. Omwana is on this call. I want to particularly uh, highlight opportunities going forward in these units. We were able to have world leading neonatal research in five hospitals in Uganda. I hope that we can do this again together. I'd really encourage you to read the paper, to look at the potential impact. So there's a non-significant uh, impact at 28 days in this trial, but across Africa pooled, that's a 14% neonatal impact and it's cost saving. So really important for us to think about how to do it. And what the trial showed was if you did more hours, you got more impact. So it's also about the fact that we did this pragmatically in hospitals where the duration of kangaroo mother care wasn't enough. So we need to move forward also with looking at the whole of small and sick newborn care so that we can have respectful space for women to do more KMC. So that leads me into this important shift what is it we want to do, including particularly KMC and respiratory support for preterm? It takes a systems change. So in that systems change, WHO and UNICEF have put together these 10 core components. And they're not rocket science. Anyone who's been working on health systems research knows that these health system building blocks uh, really are a key part of systems change. And that's the majority of these 10 components, plus these important parts of linking back to maternal care, look, linking forward to childcare and referral systems. So there are many people around the world now trying to make this happen, including here in Uganda. And I would encourage each of us not to be wasting time by reinventing the wheel. A baby is a baby, a mother is a mother, and we're trying to give the same standard of care everywhere. Tools need to be adapted and approaches need to be adapted to where we are. 
but many of the things we can start from what somebody else has done adapt and learn so this toolkit that you can see uh, flashing away on the right and uh, now last year had 28,000 users it's set to be more this year uh, Uganda is coming up to being in the top 10 numbers of users over the last month um, and I would really love it if you guys would also add into this toolkit as well as uh, using some of the things you can find here, very practical things like floor plans, uh, education guides, device planning and costing tools. So please do use it and don't start from scratch. And then trying to go faster together, we also have this Nest 360 network working in four countries over the last uh, four years and just starting now in Ethiopia. So together, these four countries are half of Africa's newborn deaths. We would love it if it was possible for Uganda to join. So this is 22 organizations, a mix of many types, clinicians, academics, biomeds, uh, health systems groups, um, working together to go faster. And a really foundational principle is the need to have a common data set so that within each country, there can be data that can be used on the ward and at country level to change care. Another important principle is really leading and bringing up to the four African scientists. So I'd encourage you to look at this series of papers recently published with 70% African authors, 54% uh, female, uh, with a lot of practical learning. So how can we put this together to go faster? What are the things that we need? So I want to give you just some quick highlights of some of the tools that can be used so that we're practical. How somebody might need to mute. We've got some exciting music coming. So we need to look at these different ingredients to see how this could work. So I want to come back to Malawi. I said earlier on, Malawi is the fastest reducing neonatal mortality rate in Africa. 28 districts, they already have 38 newborn care units. Now, those newborn care units are not all equal. Some of them are still one small room uh, trying to work. But we have been able to see change. And that change is really being driven by data. So on each of these wards, there is a government paid data clerk who's entering a small common data set on every newborn that goes into a dashboard that is housed on DHIS2 servers. And that dashboard can look at how many babies are getting CPAP or KMC, also looking at nurse numbers. So for example, in some of these facilities, there are sometimes zero nurses. We are trying to have zero tolerance for zero nurses. It's not possible to look after babies with no nurses. And we need to get ratios up, but we should have zero tolerance for zero nurses. And this particularly happens at nights or weekends. So this data set is being used in wards. There are tens of thousands of logins to the data set, which is accessible on a mobile phone. And that includes central ministry in Malawi down to facility level. Also in facilities in Tanzania, uh, Nigeria and Kenya and starting in Ethiopia. So this is an important principle in change. And this uh, set of, of data tools is open access. You can download all the tools. You're welcome to do that. You can adapt it and we will happily share things with you. The dashboard that you can access on your phone, you can also print. Uh, and it gives, for example, if you look at this, admissions per uh, month, deaths per month, uh, admissions by cause, deaths by cause, uh, and this is looking at data delays, so making sure that your data quality is there. And then there's a next uh, a sheet on coverage, uh, and then a sheet on things like um, the nurse ratio. Using that data is critical. And the more people use data from wards, the more likely they are to collect better data and also things change. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I think it's utterly foundational for change. Just putting the ingredients in place doesn't necessarily change. And sometimes we uh, 
uh, blame without really knowing what the cause is. So for example, this is data looking at babies who are not hypothermic on admission. And initially the ward thought that they were all coming from home, but actually the hypothermia was worse for babies born in the hospital than coming from home. And they needed to look at what they were doing on labor ward and linking. This uh, shows some of the other data being used at national level from the same dashboard. So for example, power outages, and I know this is a problem right across Africa. Uh, so we had a webinar on the toolkit just about uh, two or three weeks ago, looking at how do we manage that? What can we do with solar power? What about power generators? What are the other things that can be done? This is looking at baby to nurse ratio. And by the national level, looking at this in Malawi, they changed nurse rotation policies. So this is critical. If all the trained nurses get rotated at once, the babies die. So they have a managed rotation policy that has been transformative. And that leads into the need for people power. And I think across the world, including in high income countries, the most important cadre is nurses with skills to look after newborns. Newborns die in minutes, seconds. And having somebody there who knows what they're doing, who can act and who's enabled to act, for example, nurse-led CPAP, is really critical. And thinking about how Uganda will do that is so important. Um, and really uh, uh, leading that forward and really exciting discussions this week on different tracks for bedside accreditation of neonatal nurses and moving forward with, with diplomas. I want to quickly highlight the issue about devices. So we forget that on a neonatal unit, the average baby there for small and sick newborn care level two may need up to 16 devices. It's not just one device. So respiratory support, but also pulse oximeters for safe oxygen, IV fluids, phototherapy, syringe pumps, and so on. So if we need those machines, and we need them for the baby. We need to love our hospital biomedical technician. Otherwise, the equipment goes to an equipment graveyard and so does the baby. We rely too much on random donated devices without thinking about the whole pipeline. And I don't have time to go through this pipeline, but I would encourage you to look at the newborn toolkit and think, you know, what devices do we need? What specs? how many for a 40 bed unit and so on. And there are lots of uh, particular tools to help you estimate which devices look at specs, look at cost, uh, but also a very helpful webinar on how to keep them out of the graveyard. I wanna move onto the money to land on that because all of this takes money and one of the things that I've seen over now 30 years working across Africa on newborn care. When I started in Ghana as a neonatologist, as Dr. Idro mentioned, we just did our best. <laughs> you know, we got a small room, we tried to have an extension cable, we added donated equipment, you know, we really just struggled. And what analysis has shown on a policy and power at the table side is we're too nice. You know, this is actually now leading cause of death in Uganda, having newborns die. It's not charity, it's the future of your country. And we need to make this investment case clearer. So in Tanzania, doing this investment case, looking at how much was needed to reach 80% of districts with a neonatal care unit. For every $1 invested, it's estimated between eight and 12 back, and that will be similar in Uganda. It's about a two and a half percent increase in the total health expenditure, which given the gains is very affordable. So excitingly, after this was done in Tanzania, the government of Tanzania were able to leverage more than 30 million from different parts, including from the president's special fund for infrastructure, including for HR and including for devices. So here in Uganda, there is an investment case in process, and we hope that you uh, as a community would be involved in that, uh, that this would go forward and lead to more money that comes in to scaling up neonatal care across Uganda and making it work.
And part of that is thinking about the infrastructure, because if we have a tiny room with no space, it's not respectful for women. They can't possibly do kangaroo mother care. And it's not respectful or possible to do quality of care for the babies. So I know that Uganda is now looking at a standard floor plan. And this is important too, because if you are having to build a whole lot of units or refurbish them, you don't want to be repeating uh, different architects all over the country and repeating the same mistakes. So this is very exciting way forward. So I want to land with this picture of very happy nurses in a hospital in Tanzania, where the president actually opened this neonatal unit. There's high level political attention. The ward has changed. It changes for the staff. It changes for the babies. It changes for the women's. And they want to celebrate together. So to finally land, how can we go forward? Please, all of you, whether you work on newborn health or not, newborns is everybody's business. We were all one once and it's the future of our country. Know your targets, use your data. We need to go at least two times faster. That's going to take national, local action. It's good to have regional centers of excellence and they need to be built up, but we have to get beyond that. So maybe 120 hospitals need to be reached across the country. Need to think about the level four, where you have many of your births and making sure that there's at least enough there to stabilize babies. Thinking about what will have most impact and make that work and making sure that if we're gonna go faster, that we measure that whole gap and get that more of the money. And I wanna land by saying that leadership is not a gap. I'm so impressed with the team in the Ministry of Health so impressed with many of you, people I've known for a long time, like Peter and many others that are coming up. So my question to you is, Uganda has this potential. Will we deliver? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Lon. Um, you couldn't have put it uh, better. Um, we have made progress, but we are still far. And for many, many years, uh, neonatal mortality in Uganda has been stuck. We have, were just not moving. But uh, that picture which you put out today, um, which was in the monitor to, um, uh, today, 45,000 newborn death is is really a um a reality check for a number a number of a number of us um uh, ben, benjamin uh, can we take a few questions before we go to dr mukai maybe just a few questions it's all right doctor uh, professor peter's hand was up uh and then let's put it down, but you can always do some. We have Kasibanti's hand up. Yes, Samuel. Samuel Kasibanti, yes, yes. please. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Idro, for being here and congratulations. I want to go straight to the point. I was part of partly part of Omano Troy and I attended the dissemination meeting in Entebbe. And I thank Professor Lone for the good work she has done among us to raise a number of issues before us, which we can use as interventions to improve newborn care. I'm a bit laid back because even after highlighting some of these issues, we cannot get a few issues. We need to make sure that we save as many neonates or newborns as possible. And I think in this meeting, we need to be a bit more intentional. Recently, I was holding a conversation with one of the pediatricians in the region, and she was so worried that uh, she can't save babe neonates and newborns because even getting um, um, a CPAP machine into the, the, the few functional NICUs in the region is difficult to come by. And I, I asked her, but how much is this machine? This um, 
forget, I think I posted about this, costing not more than 30 million Uganda shillings. And she told me, if I can get on three, I can really save as many baby, other factors kept constant because you cannot uh, really, really ex, uh, 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 you exhaust it, the other factors. So what are we doing? What can we do to make sure that at least some of these equipments and devices come to our region? But I thank Professor Joy for the research that we've conducted and for the dissemination and for coming back to tell us what's happening elsewhere and what we need to do. Thank you so much. I, I, I beg to, to end here. I'll just take two more questions and please just uh, 30 seconds, no more than a minute of question. Kasada Nasa and then Dr. Bodo Bongomin. Kasada, could you unmute and ask? And thank you, thank you very much. Um, I would like I would like to appreciate Professor Long for that um, wonderful presentation and giving us light uh, in the newborn care space. Um, my a concern uh, for us and you find out that uh, facilities are not at the desired level of care because it's not because they don't have um, some of the gadgets, some of the devices, but they have the devices which are seated in the store because they are not by medical technician. Like uh, the previous speaker said, let's be intentional. Let's employ these people. Let them be on ground. You have a CPAP machine. Like those facilities made have CPAP machines, but they're faulty and they're not by medical technicians repairing them in time to save babies. Goodwill towards newborn health and we have by medical technicians to frequently repair these machines to save more newborns in the country. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kassad. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bongomin? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Idwan. Thank you, uh, Professor Lon. Uh, uh, and I follow you, I wasn't able to attend this. I'm Dr. Bodo Bongomin, working at the WHO country office in charge of child health. I apologize, I wasn't able to attend at the last meeting because uh, I have just undergone surgery and just recovered. Now, just to quickly comment uh, on, on the presentation. One, I think this is a very good uh, sort of, it, it really highlights the key issue that we need to sort of factor in other countries to be able to move the, the newborn agenda forward. But, and the, really at the global level, WHO, is in a way guilty because if you look at all the guidelines, we focus more on the low angling foot. But increasingly, I think now there's also recognition uh, at the global level that the uh, advanced care, generally for both children, for children under five, but for, for newborn is something that is uh, that should be really a priority for countries. Now, two things. One is the issue of health workforce. I, I think that something that the country will need to really look into, particularly the nurse category that will take care of newborn, but also more importantly, uh, the issue of prioritization and a, a, a sort of uh, an intentional plan on how this, uh, the rollout of, 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 of advanced care for newborn can be done in country. And, and, and really WHO, stand ready to continue to work with the team, particularly the next phase of sort of developing an investment case to be able to take this uh, issue forward. Uh, I think those are my few comments for now, over and back to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, 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 Professor uh, Lon, you can come in, but I recognize uh, the presence of our uh, senior colleagues, uh, Dr. Nakaketo and uh, Professor Charles uh, Karamaji, thank you for being with us. Professor Lon, before we allow Dr. Mugai to come in. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I thank people really for these profound and helpful comments. And I've put some things in the chat, so I won't take more time. Um, but I think WHO has a lot of really great resources. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bodo, on this and, um, uh, you know, working very closely with them. And in fact, Dr. Queen Dubey, who's there, who's a very good close friend of mine, is really leading on the neonatal workforce. Um, so we have an upcoming webinar that her and others will do on the 30th of July, which will give more, uh, I think, lots more opportunity and excitement for her to do this faster. Uh, so thanks so much. It's such a privilege to be here with you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, well, finally, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Mugahi to, to make some comments on behalf of the Minister of Health and Dr. Mgai, there's a um, there's a, a question for you in in the chat, um, and it's it's about the implementation of um, um, neonatal nursing training in the country and what plan the ministry has for enrol enrolling and uh, in, uh, increasing newborn care services in the regional and the district hospitals. Welcome. It seems we don't have uh, Dr. Mugahi, but okay. maybe, Dr. maybe Dr. Nakaketo can make some comments as to the newborn uh, working group. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lon. I think uh, you have been at this game for so long and we hope that uh, as Uganda, most of the things you are doing, I know Professor Waiswa has uh, done a lot of research and uh, we are trying to implement everything you have said, Professor. We are implementing it, but we are not coordinated enough. And I think what we need now to move faster is to get and we all move. I remember on Thursday, uh, it was uh, Elma who said that the Minister of Health should come up with a package, which is one, and we all follow that and everybody's feeding into that. Because everything you have talked about, it is actually what we are doing. But because it is so fragmented and here and there, but uh, I was there to listen to whatever the investment case. Before I feel before we go into that big investment case, there are so many facilities here and there. They have started units at Health Center Falls. I think if we can maximize on those first before we build the big, huge ones, because most of the district hospitals, they have some space. Let us first fill those with the devices, equipment. And as we said, we are looking for a maintenance system. The bio biomedicals are nowhere to be seen. There's one biomedical engineer for a whole region. And by the time equipment gets broken for a whole six months. And the other thing which we have encountered is the uh, things like water, the water systems, electricity, I mean, we cannot, even if you bought all this equipment and there's no enough power to drive them, there's no water just to wash hands or to clean equipment. So I can go on and on. Actually, I didn't say anything that day because to me, we are just scratching things on top. As a country, we just have to become more serious. I thank you very much and I know we are all here at more than 200 people. We have listened to the experts and I think we need to pull up our socks. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, um, the team. I want to invite Professor Peter to give the closing remarks and also close this session over to Prof. Um, 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Jaylon, and um, I must also say uh, to Dr. Nakakato, uh, my video is somewhat is failing, but when I was um, beginning to, newborn, to do newborn health, I was recruited by and mentored by Jaylon, almost taking me hand by hand, one step by step, uh, uh, back in uh, 2008. And um, then I ended up doing a PhD there. And since then, um, I could say she's been uh, my number one or two mentors. And uh, at a personal level, I'm so grateful. Uh, I don't want to say anything more because I think you said it, and Dr. Nakaketo uh, summarized it. We need packages that we implement with quality, with equity, and the, uh, so we need management systems. And I hope the leadership can take up this and the commit to implementing, because we have everything in place in the country. Professor Joy Lone, we are so grateful for coming to Musoga and Musoga Health Forum. This is a platform which has been running webinars the last two years. It began by mistake at 8 p.m. during COVID, but somehow has continued to go on. And I thank Benjamin here, who coordinates. Would like to ask, could you put the certificate? Could, uh, um, some screen. Benjamin, where is the some screen? No, this is something else on the screen. Uh, uh, Professor Joy, so this problem uh, is right, gives uh, a small certificate of, of appreciation to its presenters. Uh, Benjamin is trying to share it, and uh, but uh, we'll send it over to you. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Idro, Professor Idro, thank you. And once again, congratulations, Dr. Idro. Dr. Idro is now our Deputy Principal, College of Health Sciences, and we have a lot of expectations in that. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe, you can say uh, your last remarks and say bye to your fellow Ugandans. Alakra noi noi noi. The people here fear to go to Kalamoja even when the people in Utsoga are closer. <laughs> Whatever that means, but that's Kalamoja. <laughs> thank you so much. I like, I like thank, thank you. Such an thank honor. You. And I hope you will all have courage. I know that you can make a change. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, members, see you next weekend. Thank you, Richard Sigler, for joining from the US and for your commitment to the work that you want to do in Uganda. Uh, Richard has been mobilizing money over $3 million with Rotary International to do newborn health work in Uganda. And the, I know he's coming to Uganda in a few. So we'll be engaging. Richard, we have an investment case. So we hope uh, you'll buy into it and mobilize some resources. Thank you. Bye-bye, members. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Many thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, especially. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.